deadly creatures, elusive secrets, and enough loot to make your head spin. Gunfire Games' new third-person adventure shooter Remnant 2 is a standout game, but it's also wickedly hard, and that, my friends, is where we come in. My name is Kodiak, this is Legacy Gaming, and today we're sharing everything we wish we knew sooner about Remnant 2. If this is the first time checking out our Wish I Knew Sooner series, thanks for stopping by. We started this series three years ago to help new and even veteran players jump right into a game and put on a path that makes even the most complicated titles an enjoyable experience. In the case of Remnant 2, our team is knocking on 300 hours with the game. So, while not a true beginner's guide by any means, it's a compilation of interesting and important information we think every player needs to know, regardless of skill level. So let's dive in. The first thing you'll be greeted with in Remnant 2 is a choice. Which starting archetype do you play? These are essentially classes, and we have a fantastic video already on the channel detailing all of the starting choices, the different skills and perks, and analyzing which one might be right for your playstyle. It's important to point out that you are not locked into your starting archetype long term, and it can be changed at any time during the game so long as you have another archetype item available, called an engram. Some of the more basic ones you can purchase from vendors around Ward 13, the hub. Others you'll need to discover on your own. Or, of course, you can check out one of our Archetype Unlock videos. If you are looking to pick up the crafting items to make the four starting archetypes, we've got you covered, as they can all be found and purchased for 1,500 scrap within Ward 13. Dr. Nora sells the Medic Pen, Reggie sells the Old Metal Tool, Mudtooth sells the Old Whistle, and Brabus sells the Rusty Metal. As for the Gunslinger, we have a special video showing you exactly where to obtain that archetype item if you didn't select it as your main or didn't pre-order. At some point, you're going to want to level up every single archetype because getting each one to level 10 will unlock their ability to utilize its unique trait or passive buff regardless of what archetype you have selected. This is simply game changing, which is why it's fun and important to experiment and level up the different classes in Remnant 2. Next up, let's chat about the overall progression within the game and how you can set yourself up for success. During your first campaign run, you are going to be limited on resources, required to purchase weapons, upgrade those weapons, upgrade mutators, the list goes on. There isn't enough scrap in the world to support your ever-expanding arsenal of gear, so what can you do to make the journey more bearable? First off, pay attention to the level requirements of each new zone you enter, denoted by the number at the top right of your minimap. This will tell you exactly how strong the enemies are in the area. If your character's gear score is within one or two points of the displayed number, you should be all right, with veteran players most likely able to eke out a three-point difference, but it's a dangerous line to toe. Your gear score is determined by the overall level of both equipped archetypes and weapons, with weapons being weighted more than your archetypes. The game also looks at your highest leveled weapon for each slot, not what you have currently equipped. This means finding what weapon you truly enjoy playing with and progressing those for at least your first playthrough is a wise investment. Don't get too tempted to constantly buy and level up everything you see. You will absolutely 100% run out of resources. Our advice? Identify a main set of weapons you really enjoy playing with relatively early on and invest in leveling those. This will keep you on pace with the content and help you avoid running out of materials to upgrade those same weapons later on. Once you also start unlocking more archetypes and utilizing two at once, called dual archetyping, keep in mind that XP will split between both equipped archetypes while they're being leveled. If you only slot one archetype, or slot one that's already fully leveled, then the one still being leveled will get full XP. Also, taking the time to kill every enemy you see, even going so far as resting at every world stone to force the respawn, will go a long way to helping you rapidly level up your various archetypes. They take a lot of XP to level, but just like everything in Remnant 2, remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Then you have Mutators, essentially the new form of armor perks in Remnant 2 that actually get slotted on your weapons. These drop specifically from Aberrations, rare, unique elite enemies that randomly spawn on specific tile sets. They're miniature bosses of their own and can sometimes even have quests and quest items tied to their existence. If you look closely at any Mutator, you'll see it gains an additional bonus at level 10. This, however, isn't tied to XP or using it on a weapon. You actually need to talk to Dwell in Ward 13 and upgrade these with Corrupted Luminite Crystals. Ironically, these also drop from Killing Aberrations, so whenever you get the opportunity, engage them and get the kill. Lastly, make sure you're hunting down every possible chest and ornate chest you can find in the game. 
These are your main way of getting large amounts of scrap and consumable items, but also relic fragments. These will progressively drop at higher and higher levels as your character progresses, but the beauty is they automatically overwrite relic fragments of the same effect if they're more powerful. Why does this matter? The fragments being overwritten are converted into relic dust, and that, my friends, you'll need in abundance to upgrade your relic fragments to their most potent form come the late game. As a final tip to wrap this section up, during some of the quests throughout the game, you'll receive a named weapon as a reward. If you end up enjoying a specific weapon and you end up finding a duplicate quest in a future campaign or adventure run, you can increase that weapon's level up to plus five just by completing the same quest again. It's a small amount of resources in the grand scheme of things, but if you aren't actively using it, why not reap the benefits and save some materials and scrap? At this point, you might be scratching your head, wondering, how do I most effectively get resources? That is scrap and iron ingots. The first thing we recommend is that you take the time to explore even the smallest corner of every single map you're on. If you see a red unexplored section of the map, absolutely go there. Not only will you find dozens of hidden chests containing caches of scrap, material, and more, but you'll also stumble across any number of secrets along the way. These often reward elusive jewelry, weapons, armor, and even quest items that typically lead to even greater rewards. If you're diligent about always doing this, any duplicates that you find in future runs will automatically convert over to a large bundle of scrap, and that's valuable. To make finding gear even easier, we recommend unlocking the Explorer Archetype, a powerful class in the game with a knack for uncovering secrets and getting more resources like scrap and ingots. As you might expect, we've got a video on the channel breaking that all down, so go check it out if you're in the market. The second thing we'd recommend is not progressing your weapons too quickly, which might sound counterintuitive. Why, you might be asking? Well, it has a little something to do with how upgrade materials drop in the world, and there are specific ones you'll need for five different tiers of upgrades. Iron upgrades normal weapons to plus five and boss weapons to plus three. Forged iron upgrades normal weapons to plus 10 and boss weapons to plus five. Galvanized iron upgrades normal weapons to plus 15 and boss weapons to plus seven. And hardened iron upgrades normal weapons to plus 19 and boss weapons to plus nine. To get that final plus 20 on normal weapons or plus 10 on boss weapons, you'll need to find the extremely rare Simulacrum. These typically only spawn one per world, meaning exploration is everything. As we mentioned before, it's vital towards your long-term character progression. Simulacrum are also used to increase your total relic capacity at Wallace, so you have a relatively big decision to make when it comes to spending these. As you progress your gear, you'll start finding less lower tier materials and more higher tier materials. Progress too quickly early on without thoroughly exploring the maps and collecting everything, and you'll be sitting on low reserves, unable to easily upgrade your gear. To help alleviate this issue, Cass, back at Ward 13, will sell a certain amount of each upgrade material for scrap. The item she sells has a limited quantity, but her supply will refresh given enough time passes. Her shop is extremely valuable, not only for buying resources, but also because she allows you to sell excess gear for scrap. Luminite shards, for example, are obtained whenever you kill an elite enemy, and you will kill a lot of elite enemies. Early on, these materials don't really do a whole lot for you compared to later in the game, so you can keep your scrap reserves well stocked by offloading some of these items and other materials you don't need, like consumables. Just make sure you're not selling off anything valuable that you might need later, like crafting materials that you can use to create specific mods and weapons. On the heels of resource efficiency, let's talk about something you can do to really farm for materials or items you're specifically looking for. Adventure mode. After you've fully cleared a world, that means all the tile sets in a campaign, it becomes available to play in adventure mode. This is a completely separate instance of the game that still utilizes your main character, and let's touch on that briefly. For the vast majority of players out there, there's no real need to make multiple characters. Selecting an archetype or difficulty doesn't lock you out of everything else all progress is made on your main character. Even things like hardcore mode, which you do need to create a new character for, award everything to your main character, simply because when you die in hardcore mode, that character is gone. In adventure mode, you'll enter into a randomly rolled instance of Yesha, for example. You can complete all the dungeons, find all the secrets, beat all the bosses, you know, the usual. When you're done with that run, you simply re-roll that adventure world either to a new instance of that same world, again, completely randomized in terms of what you get, or roll a different world based on what you choose. This is fantastic if you're stuck on a current piece of content and want to farm or really just want to locate something like more Blood Moon Essence for the elusive Summoner class, which 
You guessed it, we have a video explaining already on the channel. In addition to this, if you're struggling with a piece of content, don't be afraid to drop whatever you're doing and head back to Ward 13. Sometimes purchasing a simple consumable can be the key to helping you overcome a hurdle or squeeze out just a bit more damage by upgrading a weapon. You can even head up to Wallace where, in addition to his normal archetype shenanigans, he'll provide you the ability to increase your overall relic capacity for the cost of those simulacrums we talked about before. If you have the scrap, you can also buy the Orb of Undoing, which will allow you to respec all of your traits if you're really messed up, or just feel like changing up your traits can help get an edge in a fight. These can be pivotal decisions when made at the right time, and all of course, the right cost. There's nothing better than solving a complex riddle or discovering a secret. Most modern games have phoned it in on secrets, and the lack of truly thought-provoking brain teasers has honestly disappointed us over the last few years. Remnant 2 takes a different and honestly refreshing approach to this by intricately hiding secrets in the environment. Giant dials with ornate symbols, complex music box-like contraptions that you have to slot the correct notes, even shadows and symbols that, when arranged correctly, tell a story from the lore. It's honestly insane in the best possible way. One of the biggest tips we can give you to set you up for success is to honestly question everything, and we mean everything. If something looks out of place, it's likely hiding something. Illusionary walls, items that you can inspect for more details, books that have symbols for a reason. You know what else has secrets? World bosses. Fun fact, world bosses in both Remnant from the Ashes and Remnant 2 have multiple ways of dealing with them and resulting in entirely different rewards. And sometimes it doesn't even involve killing them. Certain quest items might be required or specific parts of their body need to be hit. The possibilities are honestly endless. It's just one more thing that makes the Remnant series so unique. The last thing you need to realize about secrets and even the content in general is that this is all a key replayability aspect in regards to Remnant 2. You will not or even come close to encountering all possible content pieces in a single campaign run. Some of the puzzles that generate might not even be solvable in that run due to a dungeon not spawning that has a specific key to that puzzle. Some secrets even require multiple players to both trigger and solve. If you play through the story and call it quits thinking you completed the game, know that's probably one of the biggest mistakes you can make when it comes to this series. This final section we're calling not the most obvious because little details that sometimes have a massive impact on your experience are often not crystal clear. For example, I'm sure you're all getting used to dodge rolling and using iframes to evade the attacks of just about everything in the game. You've also probably noticed each piece of armor has a weight value and when equipped, add up to giving you a specific weight class that directly dictates the type of dodge roll that you have. Zero to 29 is considered light and provides the fastest dodge roll in the game. 30 to 49 is considered medium and provides your average dodge roll speed. 50 to 79 is considered heavy and provides a much slower dodge roll. And finally, anything 80 or above is ultra heavy and you won't just dodge roll in this class, you'll flop. Flop so hard, you'll do damage to the enemies you flop next to. The real question is, how many times have you dodge rolled off a cliff or into a hazard or attack? Little do casual players know, dodge rolling is not your only option. If you simply tap your dodge keybind with no direction, you'll perform a neutral backstep that has an equal amount of iframes, but lets you recover into attacking much more quickly. There are even special melee attacks that occur when you follow up with an attack immediately after this neutral dodge. This combat tip alone can fundamentally change your experience with the game, and it's something we highly recommend getting used to as soon as possible. How about another less than obvious tip? Ammo isn't shared. Yes, you heard me right. All those potential co-op players out there, you need to know this. If you're in co-op and someone in your group is constantly finding themselves running out of ammo, it might not be because they're missing shots and wasting ammo. It's most likely because someone else in the group is hoarding all the goods. It's quite literally the only thing in co-op that isn't shared between party members, so make sure to call out to the rest of the team when you're in need of a restock. Finally, let's talk about weak spots on enemies. They all have them, if you know where to look. Some of the root enemies, for instance, have armor plating over their chest that conceal that weak spot, and dealing damage to the location will eventually break their armor, revealing the perfect target. Another type seemingly takes no damage and continuously tries to throw bombs at you. Consider shooting the bomb next time before it leaves its hand. You might be surprised at the explosive results. The key here is to observe your enemies. It can be tempting to want to rush in and just start shooting, but sometimes slowing things down and watching your enemies is just as valuable. 
Look for gaps in the armor. Are there glowing bits? What about trying to get behind them? All questions you might want to ask yourself the next time you're in a fight. So there you have it, friends. A whole slew of things we wish we knew sooner about Gunfire Games' new shooter, Remnant 2. As always, if you appreciate the work that goes into playing, writing, producing, and editing all these videos, we'd love your support. Hit that thumbs up and consider subscribing. We have so much Remnant 2 content planned for the next few weeks, I know you're going to want to stick around. You can also join our community on Discord, chat with the team, talk about great games, and of course, enter for your chance to win a ton of free prizes. That link, as always, is below. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.